Well, let's pray. Uh, Father, as we open your word now, uh, we ask that uh, you would just uh, speak to us with, with the power of your word. Father, change our hearts, change our lives, uh, help us to love you and our neighbour more and more. Amen. You know, sometimes people do incredibly kind things for other people. When Mari Smith uh, was 18 years old, she and her friends were taking photos of themselves on a girls' night out. I've never been on a girls' night out. From nowhere, a sweet and chatty elderly woman approached them and she complimented the girls on their outfits and offered to take some photos of them, saying, I remember when myself and my girlfriends used to get dressed up and go out. And this young girl, Smith, was so touched that she immediately asked this older woman to join their fun, insisting, why well, miss it? We're all out now, aren't we? aren't we? Let's have a great time. And so more photos were taken with the older woman having a load of fun with these younger girls. And the photos went viral on Twitter. And you'll see a photo there. See, and isn't it clear from the smile on the older woman's face that, well, she just had a ball on, on this girl's night out. It's a great thing to do. Let me tell you about another act of kindness. This time from December 2016, a woman with cancer was stunned to learn her and her family's meal had been paid for by strangers at a Chinese restaurant. And the generous person wrote them a note, and you'll see it there again on the screen. Uh, here's that note, it's coming there. No, no, that's not it. So there's a note there somewhere. And, and that note explains that he too had lost his wife to cancer. And so she wanted to give Jarena Edwards, who had lost, his, lost her hair through chemo, an early Christmas present. So they bought a meal uh, for this family. They, her and her family paid for the meal of the other family as she was suffering cancer. That's all right, we can leave that slide. And Edwards later wrote on Facebook, more than anything, having cancer has shown me that there are a lot of good people in the world, whoever you are. Thank you. Now, as I was looking through these random acts of kindness, they gave me goosebumps. You know, I just felt so good that people would be so kind to others. See, is this what Jesus is meaning when he says, love your neighbour as yourself? Be kind to others. And if I were to preach this message in the mosque or in the synagogue or over ABC radio, everyone would say, that's wonderful. What a great message to hear. We need to be kind and we need to love others. Well, this morning we return to Matthew 22 34 to 40, and you might like just to turn that uh, to that in your Bibles. I encourage you to do that. Matthew 22, around verse 34. And we are looking at these verses early in the year to remind ourselves that there is nothing more important than our relationship with God and our relationship with one another and the world. For a simple and effective church loves God and loves neighbour. So let me just read those few verses from Matthew 22, from verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. And one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. See, the evidence of a church with gospel priorities is love for God. That God has saved you and I for a reason. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And with all your mind, church is the gathering of people who love God in this way. And nor should we describe ourselves as a church without love for neighbour. A simple church is a church that loves God as God has shown us to love him. And a simple church is a church that loves our neighbour as God has shown us how 
to love our neighbour. So who are those people who want to love God and want to love their neighbour? Who is motivated to take these commands of loving God and loving our neighbours seriously? Well, it's those whom God has forgiven and who have received the gift of life. That the church is the community of people who love the Lord and love their neighbour. And according to Jesus, it is not possible to love your neighbour as yourself unless you love the Lord your God with every ounce of your being. So Jesus intentionally brings together these commands from Deuteronomy and Leviticus for there is a, an amazing relationship between the two. There's a relationship between loving God and loving our neighbour. As one writer says, and we'll put that slide up, thank you. Ah, there we go, excellent. We will never be able to love our neighbours properly and fully if we do not first love God with our entire being. My relationship with the world and its people, my neighbours, must be defined by the health and overflow of my intentional relationship with God and his people, and that's the church. My neighbours are depending on me to love God so well that it overflows and compels how I treat and love them. Our personal walk with God is everything. Now this quote in, uh, from uh, Guy John Hewitt is really a takeaway message for this morning. A church who loves God with its whole being has members who love one another and who love the world around them. Loving God empowers us to love the world and its people. So we need to explore this just a, a little more. So uh, we, we're going to do that uh, and look at uh, who is our neighbour, Matthew 22, 39. We looked at love the Lord your God last week, loving your neighbour today. Now, if you were to ask Adam in the garden... Who is your neighbour? I wonder what he'd say. Oh, I've only got one, and that's that girl over there. And by the way, my rib cage is still hurting. My neighbour is that beautiful, curvaceous, lovely, engaging woman that God has given to me. And if you were to ask Eve, who was her neighbour, she may well say, I've got one neighbour. And it's that strong, brave, masculine man over there chopping wood. He's the one that God has given to me. Now the question of who is my neighbour gains urgency as Israel head toward the promised land. For Israel are a small, insignificant nation compared to the superpowers around them. Was it possible that Israel could consider these foreigners as one of their neighbour? You know, a foreigner, someone else born elsewhere, someone from a different culture, someone with different looks, but living with them in the land, was it possible to consider them as a neighbour? And Leviticus 19.33 addresses this issue. When an alien lives with you in the land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native-born. Love him as yourself, for you are aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Who is our neighbour? Well, one day Jesus told a parable in response to a question from a smug lawyer. And this lawyer asked, who is my neighbour? It's a parable of the Good Samaritan, and we heard it from Luke 10. We need to hear it again. A Russian citizen was going down from Belgorod in Russia to Kyiv in Ukraine. And he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Oh, a Russian Orthodox priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man. He too passed by. Well, he passed by on the other side. So too, another Russian religious cleric 
When he came to the place and saw him, he also passed by on the other side. But a Ukrainian man, as he travelled, came to where the Russian man was lying and he saw him and had pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on antiseptic and applying soothing cream. He then put the man on his horse and took him to a motel and took care of him. Oh, the next day he took out 100 US dollars and gave the, man, uh, the money to the person at reception. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any additional expenses. And Jesus asked, who is the Russian man's neighbour? Was it the two Russian religious men or was it the Ukrainian citizen? And the answer is, of course, the U Ukrainian fellow, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. See, Israel's neighbours are now any foreigner, whether or not they live in the land. Friends, if a Samaritan is my neighbour, then everybody is my neighbour. The world and its people are my neighbour. Our enemies are our neighbour, Matthew 5.44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Our friends are our neighbour. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And our brothers and sisters in Christ are our eternal neighbours. The writer to the Hebrews says to the church, keep on loving each other. You and I are neighbours to one another. And Jesus shows how we should be loving our neighbour. He models the mercy he calls for in Luke 10, 36. You know, which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert uh, in the law replied, the one who had, he had mercy on. Jesus says, go and do likewise. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted even louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? That's a neighbourly question. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately they received his sight and they followed him. See, the blind man asked Jesus for mercy and they are shown mercy and they are shown compassion. The son of man touches their eyes and, and they receive their sight. Here we are only days away from the cross where God's mercy and compassion will be on full display. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, so overwhelming was Jesus' love for his neighbour that he laid down his life for his neighbour and he opened the way for reconciliation with God. Self-sacrificing love, servant love, a love willing to take risks, a love bold enough to engage communities with the good news that the kingdom of God is near. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbour as yourself. But having heard these words from Jesus, what now do we do with them? For to hear the word of God and not be changed is a terrible thing to happen. So how do we translate these two commands into practical, real outcomes in our lives? You may want to love God more. And you may want to love your neighbour more. But when I go home, how do I plan to do that? Friends, we must plan to do it together as a church. The Christian life is an intentional life within the church community. No one person or no church ever meanders into greater Christian maturity. It just doesn't happen. 
So we must understand who we are as a church and why we are as a church. We are called to be an intentional church with plans to grow and to mature in Christ. And a simple, intentional church glorifies God as we learn to love him more and as we love our neighbour. And so coming along to church and contributing money and being on rosters, it, it, it's important for a reason. Church must have value and we must understand that value. We must love the Lord our God and we must love our neighbour according to our prayers, our gifts and our location. We must know our church and we must know our community. We must plan to love God with our whole being for without love for God, we will not love our neighbour as Jesus intends us to love our neighbour. And so the intentional church understands its mission, vision and values. It plans to love and loves to plan because the gospel gives us the freedom to love. So Peter writes in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, that's loving the Lord, always being prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Well, that's loving your neighbour. Loving God, loving our neighbour. Loving our neighbour as ourselves means doing whatever we can to bring them into a loving relationship with God, just as Christ did for us by giving himself for us. My neighbours are depending on me to love God so well that it overflows and compels how I treat and love them. We will never be prepared to give an account or a defence or have the right words to say if we first do not make Christ the leader of our entire life. And so we must utterly depend on the Holy Spirit for our hope, for our words and for our defence of Jesus. Everything, friends, hinges on our walk with God. In 1965, some of us may even be old enough to remember, 1965. Barely I do. In 1965, Jack and DeShannon released the single, What the World Needs Now Is Love, Sweet Love. It made it to number seven on the top hundred charts. It was a popular tune in the late 60s and into the 70s. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing there's just too little of. I won't sing it, uh, you know, I'd like someone to be here at the end of the time. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, not just for some, but for everyone. Paul says in Galatians 5.13, you are called to be free but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, you know, that old sinful way of life. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in the keeping of this one command, the entire Old Testament. Think of that. Think of how big it is and weighty it is and just think about how many commands are there. And the entire law, Paul says, is summed up in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Do you get it? The whole world needs the love of Jesus, which finds its visible expression through his church. How much do you love yourself? Now, do you need time to think about that? Or does the answer come to you straight away? Are you willing to love your neighbour as much as you love yourself? Loving our neighbour means nourishing and cherishing others, just like we nourish and cherish our own bodies. Just as we see to our own needs, we ought to do the best that we can to meet the needs of others. It means displaying, uh, displaying Christ's compassion for the lonely, for the oppressed, for the marginalised. It means the church being a lighthouse in a dark world. And look, we're on a hill. That's where you put lighthouses, isn't it? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. 
It is not arrogant, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not irritable, and it does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then listen to these other scriptures. Paul in Romans 13, 8. Let no debt remain outstanding in, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be, Paul says, are summed up in this one rule and you should know the answer now. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. 1 Corinthians 10.24 Nobody should seek his own good but the good of others. Proverbs 24, 28. Do not testify against your neighbour without cause or use your lips to deceive. Do not say, I'll do to him as he has done to me. I'll pay that man back for what he did. Don't say that. Don't do that. We will never be able to love our neighbours properly if we, if we do not first love God with our entire being. My neighbours are depending on me to love God so well, I'll say it again, that it overflows and compels how I treat and love them. For my love for God persuades me to share the gospel with them. For what could be more loving than sharing the words of eternal life? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. Why don't we pray? Father, we thank you that you are kind enough to tell us how we should love you and how we should be loving our, uh, our neighbour, uh, the other citizens in this world. Father, loving you and loving our neighbour is profoundly a spiritual exercise, and we know we can do neither unless your spirit works within us. Father, help us to collude as a church so that together we will love you more and more and that we will love our neighbour more and more. We thank you that Jesus enabled us to love you and to love our neighbour through his death on the cross, that self-sacrifice that, that he laid down his life so that we could live. So help us to draw upon the spirit that you give us, to work within us and to grow us as a community into a place that reaches out into this world, a, a church that reaches out loving you, driving our love for the community around us. Heart, And may it be our heart. Amen.